Hello everyone, welcome to another Bible study and episode review in Shady Oak Ministries. I'm of course Shady Oak and today we are going over episode 19 of season 5 of the TV show My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic. The episode, the one where Pinkie Pie knows. And knowing that for those of us who saw the mid-season introductory banner where we got the little glimpses of all the characters and saw Cadence and Shining Armor standing in front of a cake, we saw this announcement a mile away, but it made our smiles no less small when we found out the exciting news that yes, Shining Armor and Cadence are having their first baby. And also noting that this episode was not only full of laughs as much as any Pinkie Pie episode could be, and full of very important themes and messages that kind of gave Pinkie a comeuppance to her antics in the episode Green Is Not Hurt Your Color from Season 1, we also get a very, very beautiful parallel to a certain individual who had a certain similar dilemma in the Bible, and in fact going as far as the Old Testament and starting and entering into the New. And as well as this individual's dilemma being similar to Pinkie Pie's, we also are given a similar opportunity that we could then apply to our lives and that is most important to not only recognize but apply in our lives today as Christians. So to start, could you first turn to the book of Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, again, long Old Testament, 700 years before Jesus was born, we get the first verbatim announcement that a baby was on his way. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And this was going to be a very special baby indeed, because not only with its announcement came the implication that this wouldn't just be any child or offspring of a blood lineage, but this would be God himself incarnate, Emmanuel, that Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 11 would uh, continue to emphasize on that point. But noting that just like in every delivery of good news, there's a very stressful ordeal that's going to lead up to it. Not just for the participants involved, I'm sure Cadence is going to be going through some sort of experience in the delivery, but as well for the ones who are going to be announcing it. Because you could say that Pinkie Pie, for all intents and purposes, had her own psychological breakdown. <laughs> Not unlike the one that she experienced in Party of One, or the one that Twilight experienced in Lesson Zero, but one that was definitely stressful to say the least. We, we get the episode in overview. She gets a taste of again social justice for her antics and just saying break a friend's trust is the fast way to lose a friend forever. She definitely got her comeuppance for that but also noting that we got insight into another baby being born that bears a lot of responsibility and not only announcing it but announcing it in its proper time because when you're given good news you just can't help but not keep it to yourself that's why we as christians are given something called the gospel and encouraged to frequently greatly and eagerly share it with as many people as we can but the funny thing was just like the individual who was given the first news about the announcement that the messiah was going to be a thing at all but that even more so beyond that, and even more directly applicable, the disciples went through something similar when they were given the gospel, but told to put it on time out until the Holy Spirit had told them it would be time. And again, noting that the first individual who would be given this opportunity and privilege to share the good news about this baby being born, we're actually not going to be talking about a human at first. And I'm sure that begs the question then. A human was the first person to tell us that Jesus would come. What, was he a pony too? No, no, no ponies. We're, we're going to the Bible. There are ponies in there, but not the ones we're talking about. If you could turn to the book of Luke, chapter 1, verses 26 through 23, we're going to read about actually only one of three angels in the Bible who were specifically named because of their role in relation to the delivery, birth, and preservation, and execution of what Jesus would ultimately accomplish in his earthly ministry. Now in the sixth month, and again, this doesn't mean June as far as our calendar, the Jewish New Year was around September, and uh, then six months past would be in March, and then nine months gestation, we would 
then apply that to December. That's why we celebrate the birth of Jesus on Christmas. But again, this is just uh, kind of historical speculation. You can celebrate Christmas and not feel guilty about it. The important thing is that we remember the birth of Jesus Christ. But the actual day, we don't know because the funny thing about our calendar is that we have a leap year. We have one extra day every four years, or 365 and a quarter days noting the circle around the sun, but Jewish calendars are actually based on the moon, and they have something that's even more like worse long term. They have what's called a leap month, and uh, the Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, is actually alternating one month extra every year. So as far as the actual date of it, we don't know, but the event itself is what we're going to be focusing on. So again, the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. I don't blame her. Then so the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth the Son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Now, again, this goes back to Isaiah 9, 6. In the preceding verses, it says that his kingdom would last forever. So obviously we know who's being referred to here. But with all these things being announced in this fulfilled prophecy, not only seeing physical fruition in more ways than one, but an even more dramatic entry in saying, well, of course, her having a few questions as to how this would work. With God, nothing is impossible. How can I, you know, have a baby if the baby process, I'm not married yet, so that there's no football going on here, the X's and the you get the idea that hadn't happened yet. So she had questions, but it wasn't that she was doubting that God was capable. She just needed to know how this was going to go down. Gabriel's announcement in getting this somewhat privilege of organizing Jesus' baby shower wasn't enough just to tell the mother the happy news, because I think she'd be the one who'd be the first to know, but as well the attendees, the celebration, the ones who'd be, well, for all intents and purposes, attending the party, much like the main six joined Shining Armor and Cadence in their special announcement to the town, and also noting the parallels that this would be a royal child, Jesus would be the royal of royal sons. I want you guys to skip ahead to chapter 2 and verse 8, where we actually read about a certain similar passage that I'm sure you guys are all familiar with, for those of you who have been exposed to the Christmas season. Um, now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch of their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord, we assume this is Gabriel, but it doesn't tell us, stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel multitudes of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us go down to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told to them concerning the child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. Now, with all of this in mind, we would know that in the preceding years, the many decades that would then pass between the priestly lineages and so forth, that obviously the people who witnessed Jesus didn't die off. A generation lasted more than 30 years. But you could imagine that if the Hebrew scholars, the priests, and the local officials, the authorities, as far as the leaders of Israel, wouldn't have gotten so grieved at the idea that Rome had taken away their authority before Messiah the Prince had come, as prophesied before in the Old Testament, that 
the scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh the prince has come. They thought God had abandoned his promises because the Messiah hasn't come and Judah has lost its power and authority, its right to judge its own affairs, the right to capital punishment. That's why, again, when uh, the Jews wanted to execute Jesus and have him crucified, they had to go to Rome. They couldn't just kill someone outright under government authority. No, Rome would most of the time turn a blind eye to them, just stoning people outright, but that wasn't good enough for the high priest. They wanted Jesus humiliated. And again, this was all according to God's plan. And Jesus volunteering for this process, it didn't catch any of them off guard. But noting all of these things are very interesting. Why then didn't the rabbis recognize him if the shepherds already told them about this event? Well, it's probably because they didn't go to see it for themselves. I mean, shepherds weren't very highly viewed individuals in those days. They were essentially the windshield wiper homeless crowd of individuals that you just kind of kept at a distance, guttural mouth, not well, hanging out with animals that smelled just about the same as they did, and so on and so forth. Not very highly favored positions in the job market. So odds are the reason why that Jesus wasn't recognized the Messiah is because despite all of these prophecies being fulfilled, that the religious people couldn't be bothered to listen to fulfilled prophecy. They had their schedules to go to. They had their lives to keep in order. It didn't matter what God did as long as they, he stayed there in church on Sunday and I fulfilled my obligations there. You see the issue? But even more so than that, imagine the frustration that Gabriel was going to in saying that we announced this not only 700 years in advance, but God himself even announced it saying, Eve, you're going to have kids, and their kids are going to have kids, and this, from your seed shall come the one who will crush the serpent's head, the one who caused all of our problems in the world. You're going to have a child that will come from your womb that will destroy the power of sin forever. And obviously it wasn't Cain, Seth, Abel, or any of the other number of unmentioned kids that Adam and Eve had, because we can be sure it was more than just three. But even more so beyond that, that ever since the creation of the universe and then the fall of man, God announcing his plan to redeem us and he's saying, look, I've, I've scheduled this party. I've announced that the royalty are going to be coming. Everything's set and no one's showing up. You know what? Priest, if you're not available, I'll get the shepherd. Shepherds tell everyone, whoever comes, they're going to get the show and sight that will echo into eternity. But here's the other interesting thing, too, is that what made these shepherds so eager and so, well, actively used by God to not only share this good news, but why they just couldn't keep it to themselves and were literally in the same place that Pinkie Pie was trying to keep herself from since the start of the episode. Well, here's the thing. It was that they were available. We need to note that the whole point of this episode, the whole point of this message, and the whole point of why such an individual like Gabriel, whose name, by the way, means Mighty One of God, so that stereotype in your head of angels being like fat, naked babies with a special edition harp in their kids' collector's edition model, that couldn't be farther from the truth. Angels are really radical and powerful creatures. And the good news is, too, that the stereotype we give to demons, they're outnumbered two to one, according to Revelation 12. So you can rest easy on that fact with all of these Halloween, you know, hysteria, paranormal activity nonsense. The only power that the enemy has is what we give to him. If we side with the one who actually is in charge of them, then the battle's over. But with all of these things being laid out on point, we need to note that with God arriving as a baby, with all of these incredible things spoken centuries, if not millennia, in advance, being predicted to the T on this very special day, what gave the shepherds and Gabriel himself such a privilege to not only announce this, but to actually see and witness it for themselves? Well, that nothing could be further from the truth. For Pinkie Pie to be given this express knowledge in advance is comparative to Gabriel and the shepherds for getting to see the Messiah come to this world. But even more so beyond that, knowing that the privilege to be a part of something as wonderful as the announcement that a very special baby and a royal one at that or any life whatsoever is not to be taken lightly, that it all comes back to the very idea and theme that Pinkie Pie, 
what made her capable of wielding this privilege. It wasn't that she was any more significant in the life of Cadence and Shining Armor than the rest of the main six. If anything, Twilight should have been the one that it would mean the most to her because she was the closest to Shining Armor. What made that surprise so significant? What made the timing so important? It was that Pinkie Pie, aside from all the other main six, was available. Note, not eager to violate their wishes, they were obedient to do exactly what they were told to do, be it Pinkie Pie to keep it a secret, to the shepherds to share it widely with anyone who would listen, but both are the same in the exact same way that Jesus himself gave the disciples and all of us the commandment to not only share his gospel, but wait until the proper time and equipment. In Luke 24, verses 46 through 49, after rising from the dead, Jesus said, then he said to them, there you go, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer, to rise from the dead the third day, that the repentance and the remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Right? Eventually, all of Equestria would know about this baby, but it starts with the main six. It starts with the daughter, or the sister-in-law. It starts with the aunt, right? But you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Now, the pastors before this go to confirm that uh, they were given knowledge and understanding of all the scriptures, just like the road to Emmaus and everything of the Old Testament finally making sense and being revealed in the life of Jesus Christ. And up until that point, there was just basically that, you know, eighth grade syndrome of just basically saying, I'm here because my parents told me to. I don't have anything better to do, but whatever this teacher is saying, I'll write it down. But it's going to make about as much sense to me as the language I'm trying to learn next period, you know? Well, just like Pinkie Pie. The disciples were the, in the exact same place. God is going to be the one to tell everyone the good news about his son. Our job isn't to save souls. It isn't to convert or convince people of the truth of God. What happens in an individual's heart concerning their relationship with God is between them and God alone. Only the human being can decide their own eternity and only God can be the one to draw us near to him. Note that he's called the entire world that is implied, but what they do with it is up to them. Our job is to stay available as instruments to making this message mean all that more. Because nothing can be further from the truth. Twilight's wingspan fully showed when she saw and heard this news that she was going to be an aunt. But that even more so beyond that, and for all of Equestria, this was a special day because a new member of royalty would be joining into the foray. And even more special, even more significantly, and even more eternally significant in that it's proven history that God himself entered into a moment of history, revealed himself to us, became a part of us, suffered with us, died for us, and rose again, demonstrating his divinity, so that we could not only see and know that God loves us, but have a message to share with the rest of the world when he himself is willing to speak through us. That's the gospel, not only spoken by the Holy Spirit, but through us shared through him. And just like the shepherds, just like with Gabriel, the one thing that makes us any different from the rest of the world is not only our position at the time, but our availability and willingness to obey him. You go street corner to street corner preaching the gospel. If God's called you to do that, he will provide the increase. But exactly like this ministry, we are simply presenting the gospel where it's available and where God is called. He'll be the one to ultimately decide what you do with this message. But I want to exhort you today, don't waste this opportunity to not only know that God has visited us, but also be willing and ready to keep this information in store and stay excited about it. So excited, in fact, that it would make Pinkie Pie look like Mod Pie in comparison to how eager we are to share the gospel so that by the time that God finally does call you to share it, that you are literally setting off the same amount of light show and fireworks that the angels themselves had when waiting thousands of years to finally celebrate God's plan that they themselves are still shocked at 
would finally be able to tell men God is with us, God is for us, and now God is in us. That's the gospel, that's the good news, and that's the message. And if you want the privilege of sharing it, you've been given it today. Stay available with it. Stay prepared and ready to share it. But most of all, don't underestimate the privilege that you have of hearing this, because it won't be much longer before this message becomes illegal. There is an enemy, and he doesn't want the world to hear the truth because he's a liar. But you can know that while you stand in the truth, you are standing on the right side. You are standing with the right team. And with the proper equipment, we will overcome any enemy as long as we obey his orders and march only where we're told to. Thank you for your time and listening to this study. I hope it's been a blessing to you and provided some insight on scripture that you probably weren't aware of for the term angel being Malachim in Hebrew, but you didn't think it meant messenger. But with all of these other different things and details, if you have questions about further stuff that we weren't able to discuss in this passage, stuff about Christmas, the historical context, Hebrew calendars, and all these other different things, leave them in the comments below. I'm more than happy to talk to you about them. If you would like to encourage the ministry, leave a like and subscribe. It's a great encouragement. But most importantly, exactly like the theme that we've talked about in this study, here's your equipment, here's your calling. If God has called you, and if you know anyone who would be blessed by this message and needs to hear it, please don't hesitate to share this with anyone you feel needs to hear it. Thank you for your time and listening to the study. And remember, Jesus loves you.